Hello, everyone. We have uh, the privilege and the honor to be with Lourdes Portillo, one of the most prolific and important Chicano filmmaker, an incredible professional and an incredible woman full of um, love and solidarity. So before um, we begin this uh, Q&A session, I would like to uh, regarding the two films that we have seen after the earthquake of 1979 and The Devil Never Sleep in 1994, I want to briefly contextualize the work and the professional trajectory of uh, Lourdes Portillo as a filmmaker. Filmmaker, mm -hmm. Welcome, Lourdes. How are yeah. you? Oh, I'm, I'm well. Thank you so much, Norma. It's a pleasure. It's really a, a, an honor to be with you. I admire your work deeply. So uh, I would like to share with the audience some aspects uh, of your work that could help us to understand uh, your filmography. So I would like just to start by mentioning some of your political principles that guide your work. Uh, that are connected with what, uh, and it are supported with what Rosa Linda Fregoso called very powerful, the, politi the politics of love. And I, I, I love the way she framed it. You, you have mentioned in many forums and interviews, as well on your webpage, the importance of your commitment and advocacy with human rights, and also your interest and support for talking about human dignity, not, not only talking about human dignity, your films contribute to support and, and underline human dignity. You have also comment on your commitments to women's voice and subjectivity. You, uh, uh, openly, you, you make your comments and your commitment of feminisms in plural, and how this guide you in your process of making decision in each film. That's for some of the audience, it could be a minor detail, but every de decision that you make in your film is supported in principles. Decisions such as giving women's voice an active role in your films, no, in your film, but also in cinema, because you have worked with so many filmmakers, helping them to be part of this difficult world of filmmaking. Another important principle that guides your work is the recognition of the responsibility that filmmakers as creators have in terms of the process of telling narratives and presenting new and creative ways of articulating those film narratives. And you are uh, an expert of breaking all of these conventions and norms, looking for a more creative ways of communicating that subjectivities. Your films always recognize and emphasize the complexity and multidimensionality of human experience. And that's one of the richest part of your work, particularly those that have been ignored or, or silenced. And by doing that, um, your films have contributed to break and deconstruct a lot of stereotypes about Latinas, Mexicanas, Chicanas. In all your films, you always question gender conventions and you problematize on gender identities, gender roles, and you do it in a non-binary way. I, I also need to mention that your films have contributed to breaking important cinematic conventions in, in, in cinema genres. And one of the films that we are going to see today, you know, that, that, that we are going to be talking today is The Devil Never Sleep. It, it's an incredible example of that. You have made significant contributions in terms of the new ways of telling stories. And just to uh, one more thing to for, to share with the rest with the audience. You were born in Chihuahua. Then if I remember correctly, you moved to Mexicali. Uh, and then as a teenager, you moved to San Francisco. You know by experience about geopolitical borders. You have been crossing borders all your life. And you also understand debate and problematize in your films about borderlands as symbolic borders that create and emphasize the sense of otherness. No? These cultural uh, barriers, cultural, linguistic, gender, class, sexuality, ethnicity, age, generation, etc. You also know and you play with those boundaries in genres in cinema. And, and you like, it's like a pleasure of breaking all of those conventions of uh, each particular genre. You force those boundaries between documentary and experimental films, and you create an incredible universe of possibilities of non-fictional st 
storytelling. You are inviting other filmmakers to do the same. So what we have seen today are two very contrasting films, and both of them, I think, very important in your life. After, so we are going to begin with after the earthquake from 1979 that you do with, that you produce with Nina Serrano. That is your your first film. And I think it's a good example because you set there a tone of what will be the main characteristic of your movies. You decide to tell the story of an immigrant woman in the US, a woman from Nicaragua. In this short black and white narrative, you problematize the multiple levels of oppression that Irene experienced. That, but you always do this in your films. But you don't present uh, Irene or Irene as only as a victim. And that's what makes it special, your work. You emphasize her agency, her debates. Uh, you develop a resilient character you know, with power. And you discuss the difficulties of this women emancipation. Could you tell us about the importance of two events in that film that I think are full of meaning and, and in a way express this, this uh, commitment of you of presenting complex character? One is when Irene purchased the television and all the symbolism behind the, the television. And the other is all the events around and the, around the cumpleaños. Um, could you tell us about that? These two things that are, I think are very powerful and key in terms of how you develop this narrative. Yes, I think um, Nina and I were very concerned about um, the representation of women at that time, which was a time of revolution in Latin America and how that will influence our lives and the lives of people here in the mission of immigrants, you know? And one of the things that we saw that was women were so turned around by the fact of immigration and, and revolution back home, you know, that they felt very free to, uh, to have money, not to dedicate themselves entirely to the home, but to actually have agency. And uh, we found the perfect subject, you know, with our actress and, you know, and, and in thinking about it, we saw it everywhere in the mission. So we wanted to uh, portray that. That was very important. That was one, one of the things, I don't know if it answers your question entirely, Yes, the, the television uh, in terms of their economic freedom to be able to buy something by herself. Something as big as a television at that moment, yes, you know, at that moment. Yeah, I mean, it was something expensive. And if you work as, as a servant, you know, you, it's hard to raise the money to buy the television. So it was a very momentous thing to buy the television. But also um, the television bring this debate about ideology, cons consumption, so, U.S. Exactly. Cult popular culture. Yes. Well, all these ob objects and all the symbolism and all the actions in the movie have a purpose, as you know. I mean, we thought it out very carefully. We knew how what what it meant to have money, what it meant to be, you know, a servant. What what it meant to be a free agent, you know, that was very important, especially in the mission at that time. Um, I don't know, maybe we could discuss it further, but you know, this is what I remember, right? It was a long time ago, obviously, you know. Yeah. Uh, how do you resolve? Because there are so many layers of problematic that Irene was experienced. And one of them is, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, uh, as I was telling uh, to the audience, you work with different layers of women's problematic, you no, know, in terms of generation, all the debate about marriage, you no, know, uh, and all the yes. the, the dias, you no, know, what the marriage means for that generation, what marriage means for new generation, um, so all these, how you decide uh, all of these elements that in a way contribute to portray the dilemmas of being women, of being an, uh, an immigrant women coming from Latin America to United States. How was the process well, yeah. of creating the story? Well, the process of creating the story was, I think, based on, on our own 
experience that Nina and I had working with immigrants, you know, and uh, we kind of, we did this confection of uh, many different people, you know, and, and we constructed the story based on all the, our observations and all our experiences, because we also had some of those experiences, you know, and it was so important you know, to have it portrayed in film because there is, there was no, at that time, there was no place that you could go to and actually see a Latina immigrant, you know, working class woman in the ghetto, you know, trying to survive. So, but we were there and we, and that's what we dedicated ourselves to do, which entailed a great deal of investigation and also a great deal of feeling, you know, it had to do with some kind of sympathy that we felt for everybody because we ourselves, you know, are Latinas, Mexicanas or whatever you have, you know, uh, and we wanted to portray that, but we didn't want to portray, you know, the glamorous notion of all yeah, of that. You, no. you don't romanticize anything, no? you problematize <laughs> no. everything and I, and I really like that. Uh, the other aspect that I think is central in this film and in a way it's going to be like uh, an element that it's, it's going to be later in other films is the debate about um, male-female um, tension about uh, her boyfriend coming from Nicaragua, no, being in jail first, and all his discourse about the the revolution and the the, the need of change, and how most of the time are women the one who need to sacrifice no, or ignore all of the the, the the female or women's struggles in order to to support the revolution. So all this tension between the huge political discussion in a particular um, personal relation between Irene and her boyfriend. That, that was, well, that, that's the puzzle, right? In making a film, you have so much time to tell a story. How do you actually include everything that you observe and that you treasure in a way and then you feel is important to convey, you know? So you create a story that has all these different elements that many different people are living through. And the important thing was that all this went unnoticed, you know, that this is an unnoticed, uh, their unnoticed lives to this, to this day, you know, their lives that are not um, conveyed as important and their dramas that are amazing. I mean, uh, I, and I thought this is very, it's so important to see us as human beings with all those problems, with all those petty little things, with all the contradictions, all that, you know, and that, that was our, our purpose, you know, to, uh, to show that in the richness and the love and the hates and all the things that exist in everyday life. Mm -hmm. So yes. uh, it's the best way to yeah. break the stereotypes. No, because the stereotypes are, are shadows, are people without history or debates or dilemmas. And you, you with this film, you, you make a clear statement of the need of, of talking about the conflict, the, 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 the contradictions that some of our lives, you know, we experience in our life. So that's a way to, to make them subjects and not only objects. Mm -hmm. and yeah, also, it's a way of humanizing us, you know? Humanizing them. Yes, that's so. There are so many things that we could talk about the the after the earthquake. No, just the title. Also, if uh, audience do not understand, but it was the, the the Nicaragua was changing not only because of the revolution and all the the the, the process of uh, political changes, but in terms of the earthquake that changed the life of so many people. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this is related with forced me forced migration, something that is so pertinent today. You know, all these natural disasters that are forcing the people to leave and being exposed to a new culture. But uh, one element before we move to El Diablo Nunca Duerme, The Devil Never Sleep, I want to to ask you about the 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 way you end the story and you decide the end the story of Irene in, in after the earthquake because I think it's another signature of your work that is you decide. To finish with yes, y empezó así, and 
And so it began. And it's instead of the traditional ending that you give the conclusion and you give the moral and the lesson to the audience, you decide to leave it open, as open as, as so it began. So what began? So leaving open endings, leaving to the audience that they get their own conclusions. And not only to get their own conclusion, that you as an audience connect with the elements that you could connect with it any. So what what is the importance of open ending as a as a something that is very important in all your films? Why it's so important? What is the contribution uh, of open endings? I think open endings is just means it means that this is a very small slice of life that the life that continues is equally rich, long, complicated, you know, textural, if you like, um, in that it, it goes on. These people continue to live, you know? It's not, it's a happily ever after. There's no such thing in my films for that, you know? That, that's my, that life is an affirmation of our stands in this country. You know, it's an affirmation that we're living and our life keeps on changing and being unpredictable and unseen and uh, interesting. And, and it's also, it's talking about these um, non-exceptional characters, not, not the traditional heroes or superheroes or exceptional people. You are talking about most of your films of these regular, regular people like us. And that idea of us is so central for you. And people like us, um, have a, a lot of political implication in terms of the of cinema of making visible what is invisible, but also to 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 recognize that as you were mentioned, every single story, every single person have an interesting story and so important and meaningful that could be converted in a film. Mm -hmm. So That's these right. are not regular films, regular people, ordinary people make extraordinary films, and I think this is a very good example. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. And <laughs> if it's okay with you, we could move to El Diablo Nunca Duerme because okay, I think that's very, very important, very, very important film for many, many reasons. So it's essential for your film. This, this is essential film in your career for many reasons. A story that is so close to your heart. Mm -hmm. And I think yes. that it, because it's so close to your heart, I could imagine that it was not easy no, in the process, even if we follow the, uh, the easy story, I could imagine that it was not easy. That deals with a tragic family event, like the loss of uh, the, 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 the dead of one of your favorite uncle, Del Tio Oscar. Um, you mentioned that this project become your playground for mo formal experiments. No, it, it was like a, a after an, a before and after this experience that you marry it with investigatory skills that it's so clear, sometimes even performative in the film, your artistic sensibility or your exercise of, of looking for, for different kind of artistic expression, using your intuition that is so female in many ways and it have been ways to ignore in, in, in not, not only in, in the filmmake, filmmaking exercise, I, I, I feel the same in the academic, no? that it's so on, invaluable the, the 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 intuition that is so basic to in, in terms of the the creation of knowledge and you follow your impulse to put people and i'm quoting you that is like you like me you know in, in your stories on the screen and what make it incredibly interesting is how you blend different kind of film genres all these um, concessions that you give to yourself in terms of using as many types of materials as you find, no clips of Mexican telenovelas, and you were discovering in the process, and then eight millimeters home movies, archival footage, family photographs, not only along, but the, the albums. No, you put in practice uh, this feminist statement that recognized that the personal is political. And I think it's brilliant the way you, 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 you really transform this uh, an, a, a theoretical statement to put it in practice. You erase the solid convention of traditional documenters, documentaries. Well, you began this with many other documentaries. I remember the date of the dead in which these female boys talking about subjectivity and the male boys with factual tone saying that. But here you do it 
explicitly, no, uh, that is state uh, that convention that is state that the director need to erase erase their voice, ignore, not do not be present in any kind in the film to be objective in this crazy debate about objective subjective. So, how challenging was the inclusion of your voice? not only as one more voice in the story, because you are one more member of the family, but putting your voice and your subjectivity as the central voice that guide the narrative. It's not one more voice. It's your voice, the one that is making interpretation and connecting the different ideas and, and the different experience and uh, and the different truth truths or verdades that each of your, the members of your family and the, and the people involved in, in this uh, in this debt. So how challenging was the, the producing this film? Because I I I could imagine you, you mentioned before that it's like a puzzle, no? The life is like a puzzle. But here we have a very complex puzzle. There are so many voices, the institutional one, the personal one, the family one. What was the main challenge to produce El Diablo Nunca Duerme? The devil never sleeps. The main, the main, the thing is, artistically, I'm just going to tell you that I was very much influenced by uh, postmodernism. And that, that, you know, inspired me. And I thought about postmodernism very much as a Mexican uh, approach to uh, crafting anything. You know, that you get whatever you have, you know, you cook with whatever you have and you try to make as good of a thing as you can. And uh, since I was, you know, I wasn't following like any kind of notion of how you make it, uh, uh, an investigative film at all, I, I decided, well, I, ha I have to become very artistically inspired by almost anything. I had a cameraman that was extraordinary, the, the best cameraman I've ever worked with, Kyle Kibbe, and he was like my playmate. I had a sound man who I worked with for a long time. He was like my brother and he was a, a Brazil, he still is, he's a Brazilian, you know, sound man, Jose Araujo. And all my other, you know, people all around me that were very um, uh, supportive. We were in an adventure together. So they, you know, I would have an idea, they would further it, they would support me, they would, you know, um, just be there for me all the time. And, and, and it was very helpful to me because in dealing with our families, Norma, as you know, you know, in Mexico, there are there are a lot of rules, you know, that we have to follow. And if we don't behave, you know, we will be looked down upon, you know. And I had to break those rules and I had to experiment. And I just kept on doing it over and over again with my crew, with myself. We didn't have like ways of doing a continuous style i didn't i was not interested i wasn't any longer interested in in making a documentary a regular documentary that's where that's where i lost my desire to make a genre documentary this i was interested in creating more of a work of art that was my interest and i knew that i had to sacrifice myself there had to be a sacrifice and the sacrifice had to be me it couldn't be anyone else. You but you know? sacrifice yourself as a filmmaker, because or, or as a member of the family, or how you how how do you see this? How you sacrifice now, yourself? Be more now, now. I feel now. I feel I sacrifice myself as a filmmaker. I put myself at risk of being completely an outcast. You know, because I had been making these other type of films. You know, so uh, I, I put, I, I, yes, myself was the, the first sacrifice. The second, the and, and the other sacrifice was I was sacrificing my family because my Aunt Luz, you know, really, um, you know, got very upset with me. They were, mo a lot of them were upset with me, but not my parents. My parents are very supportive. 
<laughs> which is very funny because they're the ones that really count at the end, you know? So they thought that the, the film was brilliant. And you see, I guess that's where I got my inspiration from, my parents allowing me to do whatever it was that I wanted to do. So um, I think that it was, it was a risk that I took and I, and I embraced it, you know? And I embraced it to the extent that I just, midway, I remember, you know, um, feeling tenuous about actually being a part of the film. And I remember Jose said, saying, oh no, Luli, just go ahead and do it. You know, just do it in the motel room. And, and I did. And, you know, that was, that was a jump that I took and I risked everything and I did it and it turned out okay. Yes. And mm. I think that when, when you, when you begin to, to see part of the, uh, a character in, in, in your film is with, with these glasses, no, the, the, the some glasses in which it's, it's interesting because it's a, a, an interesting sign for the audience that you become part of the, 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 the dilemma, not just someone yeah. outside. And I could imagine the difficulties in terms of production and personally, because it's a masterpiece in terms of the non-binary way of thinking, no? And it's a film that is also a masterpiece in terms of talking about the multiplicity of human experience that is not only the complex life of the Oscar, but it's talking about the multiplicity of the human experience of, of you, Lourdes. No, it's, it's like a mirror. In many ways, you are talking about uh, the Oscar, but it's, you are talking about you and you as a member of your family, but you uh, as a filmmaker. So I really enjoy the, how you bl blurb the borderlands between verdades y mentiras, no? certainties and question, what is public and what is private, what it's it, what it, uh, la, la ropa limpia se lava en casa, those things that you could talk only inside the family, but how you are going to make a film about that, no? How you are, uh, how you play this role of being an insider, no? Member of your family with this love and pain that you are experiencing and being an outsider when you pay the, play the role, the filmmaker. So how difficult is, um, sometimes we forget about you not know, the, the pain or the sacrifices that you were mentioned of being inside and outside. How, how I force myself to see this from an outsider, from the point of view of the filmmaker, not how I'm experiencing the pain of a member of the family, how you connect these huge Mexican politics no, that are behind of the Oscar in contrast with these domestic life and challenges and secretos familiares uh, and your personal memories in contrast with the institutional discourses. So I think this is one of the most complex films that you have done in terms of all the things that you are handling at the same time. And that need to, and that is why the question was the challenge so many puzzles because it's not only the puzzle like a flat different kind of topics it's like the it's like a three-dimensional puzzle in which it's the lourdes the filmmaker lourdes the family member lourdes the 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 person that is interesting in knowing really knowing what happened with the oscar but you end at the end uh, the film and that's part of your signature leaving no conclusion or a conclusion that it's open again an open conclusion um, and that's transgressive too. Well, I think I, this can remain, you know, remain without uh, recognizing the fact that I had an extraordinary editor, extraordinary friend, you know, Vivian Hillgrove. She has been my friend and, and she and I sat down in front of that film and reconstructed it, which of course it was shot, it was kind of conceived, but then it had to be reconceived again when you edit it, reconceived and rethought out, which gives you like the liberty of thinking for a long time, you know, how you're going to put things together. How are you going to tell the story visually? And uh, I give all the credit to Vivian. She was extraordinary, an extraordinary partner in putting the film together. You Do you know, remember I'm... any moment in the film in which while you were shooting, 
you realize, no, I have to do something different and to re reconfigure it or redesign the film in the middle of the, 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 the research? No, 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 never, never. I, I, I kind of knew where I was going, you know. I, I didn't give it up, no, no. I mean, sometimes I think I felt I, there was a moment when I was talking to Ophelia on the phone, you know, that I felt like I, I felt like I couldn't do it or I felt like, like Ophelia was not going to give me her testimony and what am I going to do with that? You know, she's never going to say anything. I can't record anything. You know, I, I've constructed it to be like, you know, it was this division between my uncle and Ophelia. Then how am I going to resolve it? And the only way that I could resolve it is just that was a moment of inclusion where I included myself. I kind of uh, uh, exchanged myself for Ophelia in a sense, you know, in a kind of a subtle sense. And, that, and then that freed me. I felt very free from that moment on again, you know. I can't, I can't really, I can't tell you, you know, specifically, I would really have to restudy the film and rethink everything. So for me to have this very in-depth and wonderful conversation that I'm having with you now, you know, I think you've studied it enough and then you've been like a, a wonderful mirror of what, you know, that film is about, Norma. And I, I am very grateful for that relationship that we've had you know i thank you uh, and, <laughs> and i like the reaction the different reaction of audiences depend on the cultural background and i think that that's another enriching aspect of of your work uh, in terms of the your cultural specificity or your cultural intention no clearly mm -hmm. intention in the film uh, confront the audience's cultural cultural things and also confront the idea of a very homogeneous uh, audience. That is not the case, no. And I remember doing um, a focus group with Mexican audiences uh, about The Devil Never Sleep. And it, it was incredible, the, the, the reaction of the audiences in terms of love and hate. No, that is part of the, the yes, story. Right. No? The, Oh, oh, see how she dares to to speak about their family here you know so it's it's like opening up a, a, a pandora box uh, yes. but it's interesting because at the end is is part of the purpose to talk about all of these cultural issues in mexico and the the, the, the is, is the, the the politics of the family and going going ahead going back to this principle of the personal is politic yeah, I mean, yeah, what happened is I opened that box that, you know, that every family is a telenovela, you know, and that's what Mexicans don't talk about too much, you know, not specifically about their families, how it's like everybody's reliving these crazy telenovelas. So I wanted to include all these things that are a cultural and unacknowledged and hidden. You know, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So the the culture is there, no? The clearly the culture is there, and and it speaks to other cultures too, Norma. That's that's a great thing. I mean, I just recently got a letter from Serbia that they wanted to, you know, write a book about the devil never sleeps, you know. And I thought, wow, that's like, how does it how does it speak to them? I have no idea, you know. Because but I. Go ahead. Because you are Go culturally ahead. anchor, that is, it's, it's well, well, the research is clear. No, you are not talking about superficial thing. You know about the culture that you are talking about, but many of them are universal issues. So I think yeah. it's a very interesting uh, balance between the universal nature of the topics that you are talking about, but put it in a very particular cultural um, context. No, or, or respecting all these culturally explicit codes that are very clear in all your films. That is giving the voice to these uh, silenced voices, but talking about universal issues. No, 
the gender dilemmas are not exclusive of Mexicana, Chicanas, or Latinas. No, we we connect with many women in the world who suffer from the same level of oppression uh, or the same challenge that you experience with your family. Well, the particularity of the culture in Chihuahua, whatever, but this is have universal elements that connect with anyone. It's so big yes. because you touch the most universal, deepest aspects of human life. And that's what makes it very rich, your work. That's very, very uh, flattering. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for more, but seeing or analyzing your films from today, thinking in, in the time in which you produce it, what was the most uh, transgressive element of, of the, the Devil Never Sleep? Because there are so many transgressions in this film. No? I know, yes. But some, some are worse than others. I think, I think the thing that, that really tortured me, I was very, very tortured because I had come from traditional documentary, was um, recording the call with Ophelia in the, ho in the motel. That was to me as a filmmaker, the most transgressive. I think the rest of the transgressions, a lot of them within my family, I, I forgave myself because I was kind of a naughty girl anyway, you know, in my family. So they had some expectations that I was capable of doing something like that. But that was like transgressing into the field of my work, you know? that I was, you know, not being honest, that was, that killed me, that that tortured me for a long time. Like a kind of um, thinks that it's ethical, uh, an ethical issue? Exactly, exactly, exactly. yeah. That it's, it's I think it's, uh, just to bring this to the table, I think it's a very honest um, discussion in terms of, uh, some of the concessions that a filmmaker need to do in order to tell the story. And the other is that it's it was part of uh, getting the truth, no? Your your intention yeah. of, of getting the truth, uh, know what happened because the, 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 the doubt is there. Yes, yes, it's true, yes. Yeah, that, 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 was, that was the most, tor that was tortured by that for a long time. I'm not any longer. <laughs> but I was then. Lourdes, what is your next project? I am do well, you know, Norma, I haven't talked to you in such a long time and it is so wonderful to talk to you. I just want to tell you this, that I appreciate you so much. And I'm so glad we met so many years ago. 1990. Huh? Since 1990. Imagínate, Dios mío. Um, uh, I am. I can, I can no longer make long form documentaries because I have a hard time walking. I had cancer and all this, so I had you know uh, I have difficulties. So, but I'm still making things. And one of the things that I'm making right now, which I am very excited about, is m making portraits of people that are homeless in San Francisco, in the richest one of the richest cities in the world. You know, and uh, and I'm and I just found a wonderful cinematographer from Chile, and he's going to work with me. So I'm very thrilled, you know, to do that because I think I think I have a good idea. <laughs> Lourdes, thank you so much for sharing your experience and uh, of being a film, a Latina Chicana filmmaker. Uh, I'm sure that the audience enjoyed your conversation. We would like to have it longer but we have a limited time, so really help you. And te agradezco de corazón to share with the audiences your experience. Un abrazo fuerte. No, igualmente, no, yo te lo agradezco a ti, Norma, eh? un gran abrazo. Un abrazo. <laughs>